Hello, Geography 231 students. How's everyone doing this evening or this afternoon or this morning? Whenever you're doing this, it's the joy of asynchronicity. We can just do our lecture and labs whenever we want. So how's everyone doing? Um, I wanted to just try to bring everyone up to speed real quick. So it's week three. Uh, we have got Labor Day on Monday. So you are likely accessing this either on or after Labor Day. Uh, cause I'm going to post it uh, the night before. Um, and so that's technically a day off for Cypress College, but because we are an online class and you can access this whenever you want, it doesn't really have much of an effect on us. That being said, um, I did try to keep this week's lecture on the short side. Um, the lab, unfortunately, is a little bit on the long side, so I think it all kind of balances out. But uh, just know that I, I try to keep try to keep it as uh, as brief as possible uh, this week. Uh, this is the last week that we're working in the Understanding GIS textbook here, right? Uh, and so we will we may return to it at a later date um, to do a couple of other tasks. But uh, for now, we're gonna well we're gonna finish it up this week in week three with uh, exercise four. And then we're going to do some census data, working with census next week and the week after. Uh, and that's partly because it's appropriate because it's 2020. It's a decennial census year. And also because it will sort of be our first um, opportunity to get our feet wet in spatial analysis. So that's the plan for now. We will uh, continue on um, working working through the, the textbook today. Um, fortunately, we're going to have another another week this is another week to sort of familiarize yourself with ArcGIS Pro and then hopefully my, my expectation is that uh, after you finish this week's lecture and lab you should feel fairly comfortable using the software going forward like if I have a task for you that involves pulling up a geoprocessing tool or you know exporting data, data to a geo database or whatever it might be I'm, I'm hopefully expecting you'll be able to accomplish that now uh, but uh, when in doubt you can always pull up your textbook and try to find uh, find out how to accomplish that by just referencing the past labs that we've done or uh, any of the um, appendices in the text or anything like that so that's what we're up to this week. Um, so without further ado, let's jump into this week's lecture. All right, Geography 231, Spatial Analysis, Week 3, Geodatabases. Let's get at it. All right, first thing I want to mention to everybody, uh, a new update to ArcGIS Pro has been released. It's ArcGIS Pro version 2.6.1. So uh, you should be prompted to update your ArcGIS Pro um, when you open it. And so just make sure you don't ignore those little update prompts. Just go ahead and do it. It's I think it was about 50 or 60 megabytes when I did it. So it's not, not a massive uh, increase in size. Uh, shouldn't use it much of your hard drive space, so just make sure you keep everything up to date on that. Today's lecture is called Working with Geo Databases, uh, and the tutorial will be, it's already available for you right now in the module. I cover exercises 4A and 4B. Uh, you will do the remainder on your own. And as I mentioned, it is it is a little bit on the longer side, but uh, the skills that you learn in this week's lab are really useful, and they're gonna you know, they'll come into play quite a bit over the course of the semester. So make sure you definitely do every step, um, every every exercise here in exercise four. Uh, don't skip anything, and uh, it will be for your benefit. Um, so the uh, the full lab is exercise four A through four G, and then upon completion of this lecture and lab, you should understand the uses and capabilities of geo databases. Uh, how to import data into a geodatabase in ArcGIS Pro, uh, and what SQL is and how it's used, and I will explain that shortly. All right, about geodatabases. So a database is an integrated set of data on a particular subject. That's any database. So you can step outside the GIS world momentarily and think about uh, databases of all kinds. All right, so uh, before there were computers, there were databases. They have existed for a very long time. Anytime someone or some organization wanted to keep a large amount of information about a particular subject, they would build a database. Uh, up until computer, the computer age, they were just it was uh, file folders full of you know loose leaf paper and then put into a big cabinet probably. Uh, and so the great thing about computers is it takes all those hard copy papers and digitizes them and allows you to essentially break things down into bits and bytes. Uh, and we have databases now which are used for many different things. And we've got a couple of examples in a moment. Uh, geographic databases 
on the other hand, uh, are often known as geodatabases in the ESRI environment, in the ESRI parlance. We, we call them geodatabases. It's actually like a proprietary term, but as the name implies, it's a geographic database, uh, and they're simply databases containing geographic data for a specific location. And really, there aren't even um, spatial limitations on it. You could have a geodatabase that has data for all over the world or what you know there's no no real limit on what you can store in a database um, it just has to be certain file formats like feature classes feature data sets uh, topologies annotation uh, tables there are many different things you can store in, in a database but to have a nicely organized useful geodatabase you want to keep it limited to a specific location uh, whether it be like your los angeles river project or maybe for your semester long project um, think of them as a, what I would say is a spatial file folder. Okay, so it's a file folder for your data and it refers to a specific location. Okay, so geographic data may be stored as vectors or rasters. You can store vectors or rasters in a geodatabase. As I said, topologies, annotations, so on and so forth. Uh, this is just a quick example of all of the different uh, geographic data, spatial data, um, and annotation data that can be stored in a geodatabase. Uh, just the ones that catch my eye, we've got place annotation, points, lines, polygons, topologies, um, tables, uh, we've got uh, networks, um, measurements, a fairly large uh, number of different types of data can be stored in geodatabases. And there are also different types of geodatabases, actual different the, the differences in the file format themselves, and I'll explain that in a bit. So databases are foundational to not only GIS, but to all digital collections. All right, so think of the massive selection of products on Amazon. Um, whenever you go into Amazon, you go to amazon.com, you basically have a little search bar or you can you know, browse, uh, but ultimately it's what Amazon is, is just a massive database of products. And obviously it's an e-commerce site too, so you can order those products. Uh, but just a couple of statistics, 12 million products are sold by Amazon, the company itself, and then uh, an additional 350 million products are sold through the Amazon marketplace by third party sellers. Uh, so imagine trying to organize uh, that much product uh, and you obviously would need to rely on some pretty heavy duty uh, databases and sure enough they do and they employ many hundreds if not thousands of people to manage these databases and keep track of uh, product make sure things are up to date in the databases in real time uh, and so on so databases at amazon uh, consider the seemingly endless catalog of songs on Spotify or Apple Music. Uh, 50 million songs uh, on Spotify and Apple Music, and Spotify has 700,000 podcasts. It was news to me that there were even 700,000 podcasts. I didn't know there were that many. I knew there were a lot. didn't know there were that many. So uh, it's just like Amazon. So music has to be cataloged and stored by genre, uh, maybe by decade or by style of music, by artist, by album. Uh, by playlists, so there are just you know seemingly endless ways of organizing music, and sure enough, Spotify and all the other various you know title, all the various other um, music providers providing services now have to rely on databases to organize their uh, their catalogs, right? And lastly, uh, try to comprehend the immense complexity of the human genome and the incredible undertaking to map and catalog its sequences. So the Human Genome Project, which you can you can look this up online, uh, just do a Google search for Human Genome Product uh, Project rather, uh, contains uh, 3,088,286,401 base pairs of genes, okay? Um, among those base pairs, there are 155,630,645 variations, okay? So just massive numbers, and this is obviously about genetic code and such. So uh, the Human Genome Project also needs to rely, or need to rely on databases to maintain all this. And you can, um, if you're into genetics, it's, there is a treasure trove of information on the Human Genome Project website. So the, the, the bottom line here is that databases are not limited to geographic data. They're useful for many different things, and they have a, really a great capability to organization and for uh, accessing data for querying and for organizing. So uh, most digital databases, um, including geographic databases, are known as relational database management systems. So it's not just a collection of files, uh, it's also the file structure, how the files are organized, how they relate to one another, how you can pull data from a geodatabase or from a database, 
Um, and the entire structure that's involved there is called a RDBMS, a Relational Database Management System. So it's not just the database, not just think of it as, as opposed to a big stack of, of papers, it's actually a very highly organized uh, file recall system. So if you're looking for, you know, a, a, a file that's, you know, starts with the letter M, you can type in M and then pull all the data that starts with M, right? So uh, it's the, the underlying system that helps present the data to the user uh, is the RDBMS. Okay, so uh, RDBMSs tend to have um, two uh, sets of two-dimensional tables. Uh, one represents the feature and the other about its attributes. So in the context of Amazon, for example, uh, the feature might be, um, we'll say, a, a computer. Its attributes might be the RAM, the hard drive space, the processor, the monitor size. You know, does it come with uh, any extra products like a mouse or whatever? So you've got the feature itself and then you've got its attributes, the characteristics that can then be queried, right? So let's say that in Amazon, you want to look at every computer that costs between $500 and $600, has a say a uh, one terabyte hard drive or greater, um, has a Intel i7 processor or above. So you can type in all these various criteria into a database and then winnow down your data from everything down a little more specific, more specific, more specific, until you finally arrive at the specific item that you're looking for, okay? Uh, in a geographic RDBMS, um, the feature is is an object, a point line or a polygon. So my examples here on the map, we've got um, the United States uh, and the map itself, and then the table, uh, the associated attribute data. And so we'll just look at, we'll say the West Coast, California. Not only is it known as the state of California, but in the attributes, it's also got a subregion. The subregion is the Pacific, okay? So the Pacific Coast. All right, so these are various criteria. And so if you wanted to find every state that was in the Pacific region, you would enter subregion equals Pacific, and then that would pull Washington, Oregon, California, Hawaii, and Alaska, right? That's what they have in common. Okay. But uh, databases are more than simple storage systems. Uh, they also allow for querying, and querying is uh, a very important aspect of uh, databases because you might have all the information in the world, but if you can't find what you're looking for, it all is for naught, right? So um, a massive stack of papers isn't that useful, but a stack of papers that's well organized and uh, uh, easy to um, find what you're looking for, that's much more useful. So <clears throat> databases allow for uh, querying. Um, it may be a simple query like all men named Mike, all right? So you're going to have all the men in the world, you'll end up with all the men named Mike. Great, right? But maybe you want it to be a bit more specific. See, here's all the mics. Hi, we're all mics. You called? Okay. No, we don't want those mics. Uh, you might have a more com complex query instead. So how about all men named Mike, born in the year 1966 in Brooklyn, New York, with a 71-inch reach and a face tattoo? What Mike might that be? Some of you probably already know. Mike Tyson, right? So he meets all those criteria. If there's another Mike in the world who was born in 1966 with a face tattoo, I'll be surprised, but it's possible, right? So queries allow you to be as specific as you want. The more specific your query, the fewer and fewer items or results you will receive, okay? So most RDBMSs rely on a standard query language known as uh, SQL. It's the letters SQL, stands for Structured Query Language, but it's pronounced like the word SQL, okay? So we rely on SQL to pull information uh, from a, a database, to query information from a database. So those queries of uh, the simple and the complex query of all mics versus a uh, specific mic would look something like this, okay? So gender equals man and name equals mic. So we start with every person on earth, we winnow it down to only men, okay? And then of those men, it's only those named mic. So it's gender is man and, and means both must be true. It must be man and must be mic, okay? So that's a pretty simple query. The more complex query was must be gender equals man, Name equals Mike, birth year equals 1966, birthplace equals Brooklyn, New York, reach equals uh, greater than or equal to 71 inches, and face tattoo equals yes, right? So if you can find another Mike out there who meets all those criteria, please show him to me, okay? All right, so, um, right, okay, moving on. All right, so advantages of databases. Um, they allow for collection and storage of data in a single location. They minimize uh, 
maintenance, uh, that's a typo, should be minimize maintenance costs and time by simplifying file locations, reducing data duplication. Okay, advantages of databases. Uh, they allow for the collection and storage of data in a single location. They minimize maintenance costs and time by simplifying file locations and reducing data duplication. Uh, they increase utility of data by allowing multiple applica applications or maps to draw on the same data set. Uh, they provide standardized security and data quality measures, and they allow for multiple concurrent users accessing data simultaneously. Uh, so there are a handful. These are quite a few advantages of databases. And I know as a longtime GIS user, I always encourage students and colleagues to, to use a database, a geodatabase for these specific reasons. Um, if nothing else, there is a certain level of security and data stability that you get with a geodatabase that you don't get with like a shapefile, for example. Okay. All right, so um, among geodatabases, there are actually three different types. Uh, we have the file geodatabase, which is the most common format. Uh, we have the personal geodatabase, which is uh, less common today, but still useful in its own right. Uh, then the SD, SDE geodatabase, it's spatial database engine. And these, these build on uh, commercial RDBMSs like Oracle or SQL Server. And so if you're working in a large like, corporation with, let's say Amazon, for example, Amazon's gonna be running on an SDE geodatabase, okay? Uh, something that, well, Google, well, how about Google Maps instead? Google Maps would run on a spatial database engine uh, simply because the data is so large that the personal and the file geodatabases just aren't big enough. So basically what you do is you would connect your GIS to a large database that has, you know, terabytes and terabytes of data. Um, and that's, uh, that's how that works. So a file geodatabase, um, it's stored in folders. The data is stored in multiple folders. Um, it's for a single user or a small to large work group, uh, you know, yeah, maybe 10 to, to 50 people. Uh, it has a one terabyte size limit, so pretty big. But if you start packing in raster data, it fills up fairly quickly. Uh, and cross-platform operability between Windows, Unix, and Linux. Uh, the personal geodatabase is an older file format. Um, I'm actually still a fan. Um, a lot of people don't really know about the personal geodatabase, but the benefit, I think, is that it's stored in one single Microsoft Access file. Uh, so if you create a personal geodatabase, all the data gets stored into a single file. So it's really easy to zip and send via email. You don't even have to zip it necessarily. Okay. Uh, but it's designed for small user groups or single user, and it only has a two gig file size limit. So it's really only useful for sending, you know, collections of um, layers, not really large data sets of raster data or something like that. Okay. So more vector oriented. Um, lastly, the SDE database, as I said, it's it's designed for large corporate uh, environments where there's just, just massive amounts of data. So you can see here, file geodata geodatabase is the, the standard format that most GIS users use. Uh, so that's it's marked there with a star. So what goes into a geodatabase? Uh, feature classes, obviously, points, lines, and polygons. Um, feature data sets, so those are collections of feature classes. So think of those as if a geodatabase is a file cabinet, a feature data set is a folder within a cabinet, and then a feature class is a piece of paper within that folder. Okay. Uh, you can contain subtypes. Subtypes um, essentially are um, they, they're in a single feature class but they can be they can represent different features so the example i use for subtypes would be like uh, roads so the feature class might be all roads but then the, the subtypes would be freeway main city arterial and neighborhood road so three different subtypes within a single feature class uh, domains those are rules uh, or data entry rules for um, uh, attribute data uh, topologies planar and network i'll explain a bit more about those in a bit but essentially those are uh, data integrity rules spatial data integrity rules uh, you can also store tables, annotation, and raster data as well, okay? Uh, so a feature class. Uh, feature classes are homogeneous geographic features of the same geometry type. So um, they would be points, lines, or polygons, right? So you could have a collection of points, a collection of lines, a collection of polygons. Um, they have the same attribute uh, schema or field headers. So like if it's cities, name of city, population of city, county where the city is located, okay? And they have the same spatial reference, the same projection. Examples be like the road example I just gave you. So highways, primary roads, secondary roads could all be lumped into one line feature class called roads, even though they represent different types of roads. Feature data sets, as I said before, they're essentially like the file folder within the file cabinet. 
and they're generally collections of features that are uh, similar in nature. So all points in one data set it could be fast food, casual sit down, and fine dining. So every point represents a restaurant, but it's a different type of restaurant. Um, I won't go through all the examples here, but just know that feature data sets are like a folder in a file cabinet. And within that folder, there could be multiple different files. Um, I already went over subtypes, but just think of subtypes as um, coded types within a single feature class. So integer coded. Uh, in my examples here, the integers here would be 1, 2, and 3, where 1 represents a connector, a freeway connector, 2 represents a highway, and 3 represents an interstate. So if you are creating a lot of lines uh, in the line network, uh, you can also, in addition to including an uh, attribute field that says type, like connector, highway, and interstate, you also can have a coded integer field, one, two, three, and those will allow you to easily symbolize each of those uh, types, those road types, um, by the integer value. So every connector will become green, every highway will become black, and every interstate will become yellow. All right. So it's easy, uh, it allows for easy designation of subgroups within a single feature class. Um, automatically display with different symbols based off of those predefined um, integer templates and it streamlines attribute entry and minimizes input for errors. Uh, domains are essentially rules about what can go into attribute fields and it helps reduce data entry and consistency errors. The goal of domains is basically to limit the potential values you could put into an attribute field. So for example, coded domains uh, only allow you to uh, choose from a predetermined set of values. So my example here would be pipe sizes. So pipe diameter is one inch, three inch, six inch, or 12 inch. So you can't accidentally have a slip of the finger and put in 13 inches because uh, that's not an allowed value. But the, the goal here is to basically say that if every pipe diameter is one of these four, you as the GIS user must choose one of these four values, no other value. Uh, range domains are a little bit different. It's, it sets a range, so uh, minimum to maximum uh, value. So in this case here, um, 0 to 100. So you couldn't do 101, you couldn't do negative 1, it'd have to be between 0 and 100. Okay, topology. So in geodatabases, uh, topology is the arrangement that constrains how points, lines, and polygons share geometry. So essentially it's about the ways that uh, vector features interact with one another and moreover more than that it's about maintaining the integrity uh, between and among vector features so topologies define and enforce data integrity um, some examples might be uh, there must be no gaps between polygons so if you've got a polygon data set we'll say representing the united states uh, there can be no gaps between states, right? Because every boundary butts up right against the other, one state to the other. There is no no man's land in the United States, for example. All the land is one of 50 states, right? So no gaps, uh, no overlaps. Using the same example, Nevada and California share a border, but they can't overlap. You know, part of California can't be in Nevada and vice versa. Um, lines should or should not intersect. Uh, so the little examples there, as you can see, uh, like a, we call it like a hanging dongle or something like that, where the the road or line does not quite touch the other line, doesn't quite intersect it. And so that would be a topology error. We want to make sure that lines always have an intersection. So lines should or should not intersect. Uh, if you don't want them to, we can tell the topology to make that rule instead. But bottom line is topologies help maintain data integrity. Um, planar topology is uh, it's a set of rules within and between layers same thing right so um, there's different types of topologies planar is what I pretty much just discussed uh, in planar topologies you can use these during editing to ensure to topologic consistency consistency between features and feature classes um, and there are many different examples of topologic rules Another form of topology is known as network topology. So network topology, it creates networks to analyze traffic, utility, water flow. Essentially, these are rules for the ways that networks connect in the GIS. So linear networks may represent different things, like I said, like um, traffic flows, utility lines, like electricity or water, sewage, something like that. And there are certain rules that these linear networks must follow uh, because they have to represent the real world. And as you can imagine, using We'll say sewage, for example. We want all the sewage to flow from the houses to the sewage treatment plant. We don't want it to go the other way, right? You don't want it to suddenly reverse course. Nobody wants that. Uh, likewise, electricity. You want electricity to flow from the uh, power generation plants 
to the transformers, to the networks, whatever. I'm you know, not, not an electrician, but essentially you want them to go from a source, an origin point, to the destinations. And so network topologies help you regulate that not only do the lines connect, but that the values are moving from one location to the next, okay? All right, lastly, getting to know spatial data, how do you create a geodatabase or a feature class or a feature data set in ArcGIS Pro? So I know a lot of you are coming from an ArcMap background and you haven't used Arc Pro, so I figured these would just be a couple of slides to help you uh, know how to create a geodatabase in ArcGIS Pro. So uh, oops, the good news is that when you create an ArcGIS Pro project, it automatically creates a geodatabase for you. So you don't even actually have to create a geodatabase as long as you just are happy with the default geodatabase in your project, you're good to go. Often we need to create new ones, and so I'll show you how to do that, okay? Uh, but on that note, when you create a new ArcGIS Pro project, not only does it create a geodatabase, it creates your maps folders, toolboxes, uh, layouts folder, styles, uh, folder connections, and address locators, okay? So if you created a new uh, project called Starbucks, we'll say a new map project called Starbucks, it would automatically automatically create a geodatabase called starbucks.gdb, okay? So just be aware of that. When you create a new project, you automatically get a geodatabase. All right, so um, to create a geodatabase in ArcGIS Pro, um, assuming that you don't want to just use the original one that was created with the project, uh, you would right click on databases. All right, so in that folder called databases where the original home geodatabase is located, you can right click that, then just click on new file geodatabase. Uh, to connect to a different geodatabase, one that already exists, you do the same thing, right click and then select add database. So um, say for example, in working through the understanding GIS um, textbook, you've had to connect to other, geoda uh, other geodatabases. So that's how you do that. Uh, lastly, to connect to a different RDBMS, like if, say you work at Google and you want to connect to the server that contains all the map data, you'd right click on databases and do uh, new database connection. And then you have to choose the database type, Oracle, SQL Server, whatever it is, you need a password, all that. So a little bit more in depth, but uh, those are the ways that you connect to a geo geodatabase that already exists. To create a new one, um, you follow a very similar step. You right click on that databases folder um, and then you just go new, right? So um, right click, new. I've already mentioned that, right? So um, how do you tell which is the new geodatabase and which is the old one? Uh, the original home geodatabase has a little house icon on it, okay? Telling you it's the home geodatabase and the new one does not. So you can have as many geodatabases as you want with as much data as you want, but the original home geodatabase that has, shares the name with the project will always have that little house icon. All right, so uh, vector feature classes, including points, lines, and polygons, should be created and stored within a geodatabase. Um, shape files are, are handy little file formats, but they have limitations. So shape files are good for sharing relatively small data sets if you have a large number of um, attributes or a large number of features then you should probably try to stay away from shapefiles unless you plan on sharing them with other people. If it's just for yourself, just create a feature class in a geodatabase uh, and then uh, you will have uh, better luck, you know, without better luck not having crashes and freezing and things like that. So shape, like I said, shapefiles have a purpose, but they are not the most reliable or secure file format. So to create a new feature class, you right click on a geodatabase, new, feature class, okay? Uh, and then you you will be propped with the create feature class wizard, and it basically will walk you through. This is a new thing for ArcGIS Pro, and you actually don't have to use the wizard, but it is kind of kind of nice. So it'll ask you for the name and the alias of the new feature class. So names, obviously, you can't have spaces, you can't start with a, your file name, can't start with a number, uh, and so you oftentimes want to have a relatively short kind of coded name for the feature class name, but the alias allows you to type in with spaces and numbers and all that. And so then you can actually have a longer X kind of a more explanatory name for the alias. Then you add your fields. So you give the fields names, give it a type, uh, set the projection. Uh, then the, the next three um, uh, options that you're presented, uh, it's always best just to use the default settings. At least that's been my experience. So X, Y, and Z tolerance, 
X, Y, and Z resolution and storage configuration. Unless you have a reason to change those, you just leave them as a default. And I've never really had a reason to change them. Um, and so there you can see the example of new McDonald's. I created a new feature class called new McDonald's in the McDonald's Geo database. And there's the point feature. And then to start editing it and adding features to the new feature class, you just drag that into the map or click the add data button, and then you can edit it and change it around. Oh, all right. So that is my last slide. Um, be sure to check the uh, module on Canvas to see uh, what I'm looking for you to upload from exercise four. Uh, bas basically, it's going to be a map. Uh, and then I have a question that I'm going to have you answer. Okay. Uh, and so thus concludes the lecture, just a little over 30 minutes. And uh, yeah, until next time, have a great day. Bye-bye.